Well, welcome. We're in our second series on the frog life, and this morning's title is Frog Your Money. And we're talking about how do we live fully relying on God. And one thing I wanted to clarify, because I know I have some legalists in my audience, I know some of you are so analytical that this title is going to bother you a little bit. And you're saying, how in the world do I fully rely on God? Does that mean I sit at the house, and God gets me a job, and He takes me to work, and He pays my salary? Like... What do you mean fully rely on God? And what I want to suggest to you is that what I mean by fully rely on God is kind of like you rely on your legs to walk. You rely on a car to get you somewhere. You rely on your phone to make a phone call. Like God is there for a specific reason, a specific purpose, and when you use Him and put Him in the right place in your life, then your life works and you can accomplish things that you can only accomplish when you're relying on God. And without him, there will be an absence of a large section of what God wants to do in your life. So it's a collaboration together. So this morning we're going to talk about frogging your money. Now, forgive me for using frog as a verb throughout this sermon series, but it just makes sense to me. If it doesn't to you, I'm sorry. I get to pick the titles. So <laughs> that's that. All right. Pastor with an attitude. That's a good way to start. Uh, next slide, please. This clicker never works the first time. You watch, it'll work again. So last week we talked about our relationship to money. And so we began by defining and understanding and thinking about our relationship because your relationship to money is very personal, right? Very intimate. If you're holding $20 in your hand and I come and grab it and run, we'll see how much you care about money. I will probably be tackled from behind by someone who I would think is slower than I am, but amazingly when I took their money, they became really fast. Because we care, our money means something and how we spend it and if somebody steals it or something happens to it, it's very personal to us. And we, if you think about it, it's not uh, unbelievable that that would be true because money gets us a lot of what we value and a lot of what we need. So money is that tool by which we acquire things that are a priority to us. And so we saw uh, last week, we learned this important lesson. Next slide. So maybe it won't work. Uh, we said you have to have God and money in the right place in your life. And the only way to have a healthy relationship with money is to have a healthy relationship with God. And that means God has to be first and money second. Jesus said it this way, you can't serve two masters. You can't have money in the master role if you want God in the master role. And the only place and the only person you want in the master role is God. Anything else will ruin your life. But God put in that place, everything starts to work. And so if you get money, I mean God first and money second, then things can start to work. And so now we want to talk about how do we how do we, come on, <laughs> next slide, how do we frog our money? What do we do with the resources God has given us? The first indication that we have in the Bible about doing something with our resources and with our money is in Genesis 14. This is only 14 chapters into the Bible itself. And if you know this story, in Genesis 14, Abraham's nephew Lot was taken captive with a bunch of other people from Sodom and a few other cities. And what happened was several kings got together. They went and attacked a bunch of other cities and kingdoms. And they took away with them captives, a lot of goods and, and animals and gold and silver and all of that. And Abraham felt impressed by God to go out and to meet these kings on their retreat and get back his nephew and all the goods. And God blessed him, and he did. And just with his own servants and his own little army, he went out and won the battle. He returned from defeating King Kedalomar, 
and the kings that were allied with him. And then there's something interesting that happens after he wins the battle. It says that he was met by Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who brought out bread and wine. Does that sound familiar? Very fascinating. Very early in the Bible, we hear of bread and wine being brought. And it says that Melchizedek not only was a king of Salem, he was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham, saying, blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. Praise be to God Most High who delivered your enemies into your hand. Now, it's fascinating. Do you notice that last line? Abraham, who was a servant of God, who was called by God to leave his country and go settle in this new land, who had become the father of God's chosen people, of the Jewish and Hebrew people, Abram and Melchizedek believed it was God who delivered the enemies into his hand. This gives us a secret into how the followers of God should view their resources. Because Abraham went and he conquered, he got back all these resources, all the spoils of war he now possessed, and he could have said, hey, it was my men, my swords, my shields, my strategy, we risked our lives, these are our goods. But how does Abraham look at it? God delivered your enemies. He saw this as a blessing from God. And so it says that Abraham then took how much? A tenth of how much? Of everything. And gave it to the priest of God. And then if you read the story, he then returned to the different kings and cities, the different spoils, and Abraham didn't actually keep anything. Even though the king of Sodom said, no, please keep something for yourself. You, you did the work. You deserve it. And Abraham said, no. So Abraham first gives a tenth to God, and then he gives the rest to the people who it originally belonged to because he didn't feel it was his. And Abraham went back to his place. So Abraham, as the father of God's people, models for us this idea of giving. Well, let's keep talking about it. It comes up again in the Bible. In fact, when God uh, institutes... Next slide. When God institutes his people and sets up the structure, remember they created a sanctuary and a tabernacle there in the desert, and he set them all free and brought them out of Egypt. He says, I want to give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. So here we have the tabernacle, which is called the tent of meeting. It's God's temple. And God appointed one of the 12 tribes to have individuals who would serve in the religious capacities of this temple and encourage the spiritual life of the nation of Israel. And he says, I want the rest of the Israelites to give a tenth of all their income, which in their case was grain and oil and wine and lambs and goats. And these, they weren't paid, they weren't on payroll. There was no uh, pay stub going to each of the Israelites. They raised their own uh, income by farms and uh, animals and things like that. And so they would bring a tenth every year, give them to the Levites, because the Levites would not be farming. The Levites would be doing the religious duties required uh, for the people. They would be the spiritual leaders. So a tenth would go to these spiritual leaders to fund them and support them in their ministry. Next slide. Matthew 23, 23. Some people like to say that when Jesus came, everything changed. And so in the Old Testament, God set up the system whereby he asked for a tenth of whatever we receive, whatever uh, first fruits or uh, resources that come our way. And that in the New Testament, that's done away with because that was for the Jews. But look what Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices. Mint, dill, cumin. Are these good spices? I'm not a cook. Yeah. Sound, sound pretty good. <laughs> They're awesome. Well, I do know one thing about spices. These are very tiny particles. <laughs> a spice is something that's very small. And what he's saying is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they're so legalistic, they're so concerned about doing everything right, that even to their spices, they, they push off just a tenth of whatever spices that they get. 
And so that's not obviously a lot, and I'm not quite sure what God's going to do with just a little bit of mint or dill or cumin, but they're going to take them and give them. And Jesus says, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. There's things that are much bigger and much more important than these little spices that you're so carefully counting and returning to God as if you can earn God's favor. But what's interesting is what he says next. You should have practiced the latter, justice, mercy, faithfulness, but without neglecting the former. So Jesus could have easily at this moment, first of all, he could have just left off that last part. He should have just said, you should practice the first thing, like get the justice, mercy, and all that, and we're good. But he includes this little phrase, without neglecting the former, because he's saying the tithe still matters. The tithe is important, but just get it in the right order of priority. What I'm after first, what is most important is these heart issues, these heart issues of justice, mercy, faithfulness. But then the physical issues still count, and they still matter, and the, but it's got to come from that good heart, and you can still give. And so God did not get rid of, Jesus did not get rid of this idea of tithe, this idea of giving a tenth of your income to the work of God and to supporting the kingdom of God. Next slide. Malachi 3, this is probably the most famous text on this subject. Malachi 3, 8 and 9. We're, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you, God? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Now I'm going to stop for a moment. First of all, this is powerful. Second of all, I don't think God is actually cursing the nation. What I want to suggest to you is if you don't understand what to do and how to manage your finances, if you do not understand how to do this generosity thing that God is talking about, if you are trying to hoard, if you have a scarcity mentality, then you are cursed by default. It is a curse to not know how to have the right attitude towards your resources. That's the curse. And I can prove that in a minute, but let's go to the next slide. So he goes on to say, instead, instead of hoarding, instead of trying to get everything for yourself, instead of taking from others, instead of being stingy, instead of being uh, really um, hesitant to share or to give to those in need, bring the whole tithe into my storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me, says the Lord Almighty, test me and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Let me ask you a question. How rich is God? <laughs> How rich is God? Is he richer than Bill Gates? Yeah. <laughs> Is he richer than Warren Buffett? <laughs> we have some rich people on this planet. Some people are worth so much it makes your head hurt when you see their numbers. Like, I can't comprehend a billion dollars. A billion dollars is almost an incomprehensible amount of money. I mean, when you do the math, you could spend, you know, like hundreds of thousands every day and still be fine. Like, I'm just, I can't even comprehend $100,000. Like, that, that's a lot of money to me. <laughs> but billion, I mean, we have billionaires in this planet. But they are nothing compared to our, our God. And when he says, test me, I just imagine him looking down and seeing us, and I, I know you've been there with me at some moment, where you're thinking about paying your tithe, you're thinking about returning some money to God, or you're thinking about making an offering, and you look, and you're looking at the envelope, and you're thinking, well, okay, I should be giving about $50, and then you go, but I really need that 50 And God must just, like, laugh at us, like, 50 That's so pathetic. 
Give the 50. I have so much more. You will not miss that $50. You put it in the plate. I will pour open the floodgates of heaven. Don't you know who your father is? He must laugh sometimes. He must just, and we, we agonize, at least for me, there's moments when I feel like things are really tight and is it responsible and I want to give a little more, but should I? And maybe not this month, I'll, I'll have to use it for bills and next month and God will understand. I don't think God is requiring this because God needs the money. He's already got all he needs. And we're slow to comprehend that. In fact, I always am kind of chuckling because I meet people in our church who are angry that the church asks for money. And I'm not saying you have to give money to the church. But what I am saying is that the Bible and Jesus taught that if you will give, it will be good for you. Because he's more worried about your character and your heart. It's not because God needs your money. It's because he's trying to help you become a better person. And he's trying to prepare you to live in a world, and I think in God's world, everybody is pretty generous. I think in God's world, they've learned to share. I think in God's world, people have an attitude of joy and service and giving, and they realize that's actually the best way to live. So look what Jesus says in Luke. Luke 6, 38. This is a profound passage. If you don't have this memorized or written down somewhere, I just encourage you this morning, mark this one down. This is a life-changing principle, and it's true. And Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't give us this because it's a command. Jesus tells us this because this is how life works. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That's how life works. And by the way, he's not just talking about money here. We're talking about money for my sermon, but we could put a lot of other things in there. There's other ways to give. I get that. But the principle is true. Give and it will be given to you. And Jesus is so excited to share this that you can almost hear it just in the way he puts it. It's like, give, and it will be given to you. Like, you'll have so much. It'll be pressed down, shaken, spilling over into your lap. Like, you will have such an awesome life if you will try giving, being generous. That's where it at. That's the secret. That's where life starts to work. I remember God taught me this lesson very early in my Christian experience. I was 16 years old, I remember it vividly. I was 16 years old, I was sitting in the pew just like you are today. It was a Sabbath, my dad was the pastor. That doesn't really matter, but anyway, he was the pastor. And I'm sitting there and it's almost time to take up the offering and I realize I haven't paid my tithe. And being raised with a good pastor dad, I had been taught to pay tithe, but I was just starting to walk with God for my own. I was starting to make my own decisions, and I had just recently started with my brother a lawn mowing business. And it was not a huge business at this time. We just had a few lawns, people in the neighborhood, people we knew, and we would mow their lawns, and they would hand us like 20 bucks cash, and we thought it was fantastic, and we were making money. And I sat there and I realized that I had not paid tithe on $100 worth of income I had made from mowing lawns. And that was easy math, and I still remember this, obviously, it was $10 that I needed to give for my tithe. So I opened my wallet and look inside, and to my horror, all I have is 20s. <laughs> now, how am I gonna do this? So my first thought is, who would give me change? But that would be odd to do in church. Hey, anybody got change for a 20? The offering's about to come, and I don't want to give that much. That would be an awkward kind of thing. So even at 16, I recognized that's probably not the route I was going to go. The second thought that occurred to me is, well, I can pay tithe next week. I mean, there's no way to break the 20. I only owe $10, so I'll just make sure I get change somewhere next week, bring it back, pay it. Lord knows I'll be in church. My dad, again, the pastor. So I was about to go with that. When the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and, and you know what this is like, it's not like a voice or anything, but I just started feeling uneasy about it. And I started feeling convicted. I know I really want to pay. I really want to give. And, and I've got these lawn mowing jobs, and they're just paying cash, and it's kind of great. And, and, and I'm a new, I was kind of new in my faith. And I started thinking, what if I just gave 20? 
Maybe God would bless me. I'd heard these texts growing up. Maybe God would bless me. And so I decided at that young age, I'm going to take a little leap of faith, and it was a little painful, so painful I still remember it in my 40s, <laughs> that I took my whole 20 out, put it in the tithe envelope. I put $10 on the envelope for tithe, and then I was like, well, maybe church budget. Put $10 in for church budget. $20 total. <laughs> Our treasurer says good choice, just if you're taking notes. <laughs> put in 10 for the church budget. So we're paying for the church, we're supporting God's ministry and tithe, and I turned it in. And you know what? I felt really good about it. And I said, God, it's yours. You have blessed me. What, why am I so stingy? It felt good to be generous, to let that go. That Monday, I remember this like it was yesterday, that Monday I got a call. Some lady I'd never met, she said she was a realtor. And she said to me, she said, I understand you mow lawns. I said, yeah, my brother and I, we just, we mow some lawns. And she's like, you know what? I've got this house. My clients have moved out. They've already moved. And I need someone to mow the lawn while they're gone and while we're showing the house. Could you come and take a look at it and give me an estimate? I said, sure. We arrive at the house. This is in Tennessee, and it's a farmhouse. And it has a massive lawn. So much bigger than the little lawns in my little neighborhood. And so we look at that, and my brother and I, and our eyes get big, and we're kind of like, wow, you know, that's a big one. I, I think we could do it. And she talks to us, and she says, well, she said, I don't, you know, know how much they're willing to pay, but I was looking at the lawn. Would you guys take $50? And our eyes got big, and we said, yes. <laughs> the most expensive lawn we had at that point, this is the 80s, the most expensive lawn we had at that point was 20 bucks. So 50 seemed like a lot of money. And in the end, it really only took us a little bit longer. And then she said something that I'll never forget. She said, I need you to mow it every week because we're showing the house. Now, everybody else, like, just called us when the weeds were, like, five feet high <laughs> and they couldn't go any longer without mowing. And so we had to come and knock it all down and it was a lot of work. And this one she wanted every week, $50. And as soon as she said it, it flashed in my mind, hey, I gave extra money this Sabbath and now I've got... 200 bucks a month to count on. Way more than the 100 I had in my wallet for previous work. And I said, okay, God, I'm starting to get this. And I tried to keep that lesson with me throughout my life. And all throughout my life, when I've been faithful, and I've, I'll not say that I've been totally faithful in every single moment, but every time I have, God has opened the floodgates. When I have given, God has been there. And I could tell you so many stories in fact, I'll probably tell you another one in a second, but let's, let's go to the next thing. Look what Paul says. This is brilliant. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Paul says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will what? But whoever sows generously will reap generously. That's not even like some deep spiritual concept. He's just talking about the reality of life. If a farmer only throws down three seeds, how much can he expect to harvest? Not much. Not much. In fact, odds are one of those seeds won't sprout, so he's only going to get enough from two, whatever that is. How much seed does a farmer usually throw down? <laughs> Anybody in farming? I have no idea. I don't think, do they count? They don't count. They just, well, some, some, they some they do. They take like 50-pound bags or something, right, and just put them, I don't know, and they throw them out there. Like you put a lot of seed if you want a big harvest. And if you want a whole acre of a certain harvest, you have to throw the seed all over that acre, right? You can't just put one or two seeds over that acre and think you're going to get a big harvest. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody would even logically ever think that. But somehow in our spiritual life, we think we can be stingy with God and expect rich blessings. We think we can just kind of hold everything and hoard everything to ourselves, and somehow God is going to keep giving us more. What's true in the physical world teaches us about the spiritual realm. And the joy we have is in being generous. The joy is we have is in spreading lots of seed because the seed itself will produce a plant that produces way more seeds than that one seed. 
And so you get to be part of that joy. So when God is asking you to give, it's not because he needs the money. It's not because he's trying to ruin your life. It's not because he's trying to take from your precious resources. It's because he's trying to teach you how to get more. And it works in every area of your life. But for some reason, we get really tied to our money. We get really caught up in, oh, I can't let this go. Next slide. Let's touch on this for a second. A lot of authors, much smarter than I am, have written on the subject of the scarcity mentality versus the abundance mentality. Stephen Covey, his book, Seven, Highly, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, this is a quote from him. He said, the scarcity mentality is that zero-sum paradigm of life. People with a scarcity mentality have a very difficult time sharing. They have a difficult sharing recognition, credit, power, money, or even being happy for others <laughs> when they succeed. And he goes on to say, the scarcity mentality, people think of the world as one pie. And if you take a big piece of that pie, then I have less pie. And so I need more pie, otherwise you're going to take my pie and I will be left without or I won't have enough or I won't get what I deserve. And so it's a scarcity, so I have to take, I have to take, 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 and I have to keep you from getting. Is that what the Bible teaches? Is that the reality of our universe? No. no. Because we have a creator, or in his analogy, we have a baker. We have a baker who's making pies every day. And he'll make any pie you want, and he's got all the dough and flour and every kind. He even has strawberry rhubarb. I know that's your favorite. <laughs> yes, yes. He makes lots of strawberry rhubarb pies. He makes peach pies. He makes apple pies, pecan pies, key lime. Whatever you love, he can make as many as you need, and you will never eat all the pie because he is the source. Going to him is like taking a drop out of the ocean. Do you think the ocean misses, misses one drop? No. Does the ocean get smaller? Does the world panic if you go and take a cup out of the ocean? If you take a bucket out of the ocean, do we go, oh, please, no, we need all that water? The ocean is so mammoth, it doesn't even matter if you take a drop or a cup or a bucket. God has all that you could possibly need or want. That's why true Christians next will have the abundance mentality. And the abundance mentality sees the world much differently. The abundance mentality flows out of a deep inner sense of personal worth and security. Did you know your God, your, your dad, is rich? He owns the universe. He owns this world. He owns everything in it. You're a child of the king. You're a prince. You're a princess. You are wealthy. You have all that you need. So in the abundance mentality, it's the paradigm that there is plenty out there. There's enough to spare for everybody. And this mentality opens possibilities, options, alternatives, and creativity. That is how things are done in the kingdom of God. Another story. I was a new pastor, no longer 16, now I'm 22. If I do the math right, that's about six years later, right? <laughs> Not really strong in math. So six years later, I find myself in my first district. 22 years, hired right out of Southern College, a graduate. Go to my first district in South Carolina, and I'm under a senior pastor who's overseen a couple churches, but the conference wanted to use him to do evangelism, and so they wanted me there to kind of keep hold down the fort while he was out doing evangelism. So I talk to my senior pastor and I say, hey, I'm new to this whole thing. Um, what should I be paying in taxes or how does, how does that work for a pastor? And he's like, oh man, you're starting in July, you're an intern, you're not going to owe anything. Oh, I thought that's great. You know, pastors, we have these extra benefits, we have a parsonage and all this kind of stuff. You won't owe anything. I said, oh, great. Happy as a clam. I won't owe anything. Except those of you that know better. I was going to owe something, but I didn't know that. I took him at his word. So I get to the end of the year, start to think about taxes. I find somebody who specializes in pastor's taxes. I go to him, show him my stuff, and he's like, how much did you submit in taxes this year? I'm like, oh, nothing. And he says, why not? 
And I said, well, my senior pastor said, you know, I'm only half a year and I've got such a low salary, da, 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 I probably wouldn't owe anything. Why did he tell you that? And then I'm like, I don't know. Why did he tell me that? How much am I going to owe? I don't have any, I'm new. I don't have anything saved up. I mean, I'm too young to, to save money at this point. I'm just trying to support myself. And so he goes, he does everything. He's like, well, we're going to give you every discount we can, but you're going to owe something. I can guarantee you that. So then I'm in panic, and he spends a couple days, and he calls me in, and he says, all right, I got you down as low as I can go, but you owe $3,000. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm glad somebody thought that was a lot of money, because I thought that was a lot of money. And on my income, it was a lot of money. <laughs> that was like one month's income. So I'm like, okay, $3,000. So I know your first question is, why did that senior pastor tell you you didn't owe anything? I'll tell you why. Because what he did is he used a little-known law that says clergy can opt out of Social Security if they have religious objections, which apparently he did, even though Adventists don't have an objection, but he apparently did that. So he just assumed I had opted out, and therefore I wouldn't have owed anything. So in his defense, he was right if I had done that, but I didn't. we were on two different generations and two different wavelengths with that. And anyway... So I had not opted out, and I was not supposed to opt out, so I owed money. So then I said, all right, God, you know, we got to come up with this 3000 So the guy said, well, you know, we could, maybe can you come up with half of it? We can send that in and then ask for a little extension to get you the other half, as they do. I'm like, okay, let's do that. So we scrounged together, saved up. I think we even sold a little something or whatever. We came up with the 1500 sent that in by the tax deadline with an extension, and I think we had another three or four months or whatever it was to pay the next 1500 And so a couple months went by, and I remember very distinctly that some extra expenses hit us, which is what happens, right, when you're already behind. If you're behind, it seems like that's when the tires go out and the heater goes out and uh, the relative calls asking for money or something. And so here we are coming up to our next deadline, and we don't have the 1500 and I remember talking to God. I'm like, God, listen, I'm honest. I'm just trying to do your work. I'm just trying to make it by. I, I, you know, help me. How are we going to do this? I need your help. And I'm praying for that extra 1500 some way, somehow. Well, wouldn't you know, one afternoon, South Carolina, summertime, a storm comes blowing through. And this was a mean Midwest, South Carolina, high heat, high summer really tornado spawning kind of storm. And as the storm comes through, all of a sudden I hear this sound on our roof. And I look outside and big hail, like golf ball sized hail, are falling. I don't think anything of it. I just pray that my little apartment does not collapse. And the whole storm blows over in like 10, 15 minutes. There's debris and damage everywhere. And I go outside and I look at my car. Boom, 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 boom. Little dents. You've had this before? Little dents in my car. Not really bad, but enough to see them. So I'm like, oh, well, I think that must be covered under insurance. I've got to figure that out. So I called State Farm, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, we've set up emergency centers in your area because of all the hail damage and people with their houses and their cars and whatever. They, made it, they said, when do you want to bring it in? So I make an appointment. I bring the car into them. I, I don't know how any of this works. I'm still only 22 years old. I drive it in. The guy looks over it, and he's got this pad, and he's writing this stuff down. And I'm just waiting. And at the end, he goes, all right. And he goes back to his office, and he comes back out, and he hands me a check for guess how much? $1,500. And he says, here you go. And I look at the check, and I said, what's this for? He says, for the car. I said, well, I thought you were going to fix it. He says, you can fix it with that money. I said, do I have to fix it? He said, no, you don't have to fix it. <laughs> Maybe a little too honest with the State Farm agent. Because <laughs> it was an old car. <laughs> I was 22. <laughs> Back to the... So I said, I don't have to fix it. He's like, no. I said, okay. And I left. And I came home, and I'm like, honey... $1,500, like that's exactly what we need. We put it in the bank, sent a check to the IRS, and I just thought, how amazing that God can use the weather to get me money. <laughs> like, I mean, that's the closest thing to just raining money. Like, if $1,500 had come from the heavens, I would have been amazed. I just didn't know it was coming in the form of hail. True story. Send it in, that was that. 
God, if you will give him, he will bless. He knows your needs. He has a million ways, even if he has to hail your car a little. By the way, I didn't care about those dents. Those dents were the most beautiful thing I used to look at on that car. <laughs> and you know what? I sold that car for not much less than I paid for it because it was an old car and nobody, the guy who bought it didn't care about the dents because it ran well. So it was just free money. I love the way John C. Maxwell... I love the way John C. Maxwell puts this. <laughs> he talks a lot about the abundance mentality, by the way. Many of you know Maxwell and a lot of his books, leadership books. Be a river, not a reservoir. Isn't that a neat way to put it? We should write that down. Be a river and not a reservoir. Next slide. So John C. Uh, Maxwell has three things next that he says, three suggestions. The first one is this. Remind yourself that there is more than enough. Amen. And he literally says, you may need to say this out loud to yourself because the lie the devil will put on you is, oh no, this is all I have. Oh no, there's no more hope. Oh no, there's no way I can pay this. There's no way I can be generous. There's no way I could give to God because of my bills. Oh, I can't help. I can't do this. There's all these reasons why we can't. And we have to fight our sinful nature on this because the sinful nature has the scarcity mentality. And so he says daily, remind yourself, there is more than enough. There's more than enough. Whatever it is, there's more than enough. In my Father, there's more than enough. He will open the floodgates. He says, see, if I will open the floodgates, Jesus said, there'll be a good measure, pressed down, shaken, stirred. I've got so much, just believe it. Have the faith. Secondly, he says, you probably need to t spend time reflecting on God's blessings. You see, the reason we don't think He's going to provide for us, the reason we think we can't give is because we forget how He's blessed us already in the past. In fact, sometimes He provides for us, we're so glad, we pay our bills and whatever, and we get through that crisis, and then we're on to the next crisis, and we never even remember that He helped us in the last one. That those moments when you thought for sure you're going bankrupt and you're going to be homeless and kicked out and all this horrible stuff that you're imagining when you can't pay the bills or something happens, and then you make it through, sometimes we don't even acknowledge God or give Him any credit that He brought you through something that at one moment seemed impossible. But He provided, He met your needs, and you moved on, and you forgot about Him. Take some time. Practice gratitude. Gratitude has to be an attitude. It has to be part of your life that when you see Him working, that when you receive back from Him, when He blesses you, that you acknowledge and say, thank you, God, you are so good. By the way, I am not suggesting that the more you give, the more God will make you financially rich. Yep. I just need to clarify that. Because God doesn't care as much about the external physical properties of this world as He does about your character and your heart. So He's going to do things in you. He's going to give you things like peace, joy, fulfillment, satisfaction, things that you can't buy. Now, He might also give you a lot of money. I don't know. That's between you and God and His plan for your life. I don't think it's God's intention that everybody be rich. I don't think it's His intention everybody be poor. I think He has a personal plan for all of us, and we might find ourselves higher or lower, but it doesn't matter as long as our eyes are on God. If I'm poor, I'm poor. By the way, if you're poor, Jesus didn't own a lot either. So you got a good mentor there, a good example don't feel like God is looking the other way. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus was the greatest human to ever walk this planet. So if you're walking like Jesus, don't feel too bad like God has forsaken you. Okay? And also don't think because you're rich that God is blessing you. Because Jesus had a lot to say about rich people who weren't blessed by God. Financial standing is not an indication of your spiritual status. The indication is whether God has your heart or not. And then you and God can work out how He blesses you financially or doesn't or what money comes and goes and what you need to do or buy or sell or all those things you can work out with you and God. And I don't judge you and you shouldn't judge me. We have to do that between God and I. But make sure you're grateful when He does and for what He does. And lastly, this is an interesting thing. This ties into the words of Jesus. Give more of what you want. 
And John C. Maxwell says, it's counterintuitive, but the way to get more of what you want is to give more of that. So you feel like you're too stressed, you've given, you, have, you don't have time for anybody? He says, then start volunteering. And he says, what will happen is you'll realize you'd actually had two hours to volunteer. You just didn't know it. You thought if you took two hours out of your day to volunteer, your day would fall apart, your business would fall apart, and everything else that you had to get done would fall apart, except that you find out you actually somehow have time for all that. Just like our illustration with the children's story. Thank you, Joe. That was an awesome children's story. That was a model children's story. I hope that we should put that out there on a website, how to do a children's story. I loved it. And what we find out is when you put God first, everything else still fits. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all the other things will come with it. It'll work. If you need more money, give more money. Because when you give, you'll start to realize, oh, I actually do have quite a bit because I just gave away this 50 and I still did fine this month. Like somehow God fills in the gaps. It's, and you can't always understand it. You can't always see it. You can't always explain it. In fact, I think that's one of the joys that God has is just making it work. And you're like, wait, how did that work? I gave more this month, but somehow I still paid all my bills. That shouldn't have been able to work like that. <laughs> I grew up with a good pastor's wife, uh, mother, and she used to always tell me, I pay my tithe and I find the sales. God leads me to the sales. <laughs> And she took great joy in that. She's like, oh, I get things for so cheap. Like, other people have to pay top dollar, not me. I pay my tithe, and I get them real cheap. And that's how my mom saw God's blessing in her life. It did, she did take it a little extreme when she would buy us presents for Christmas and then tell us how cheap they were. <laughs> I said, Mom, that you don't need to mention. You know, we, we could all assume you bought full price for our gifts so that you, you know, just, just a little word of for those that are excited about sales. But God did bless. God has blessed my parents. I've seen it in their life and their journey. I've seen it in my own life. And the secret is giving, not hoarding. Because you would think, oh, I need more of that, so I need to collect, I need to collect, I need to collect, I need to collect. Now try giving a little and see. Somehow it just give and it's given back to you. It's a beautiful process. Next slide. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. We didn't read the rest of what Paul said after he said reap sow sparingly, reap sparingly. He said, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart. Heart, this is a heart issue. This is why money is spiritual. Money itself is not spiritual, but what you do with money is spiritual. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. I, it breaks my heart when I see people arguing against paying tithe, arguing against giving money to the church. No, we shouldn't have to do this, and I can't. And what breaks my heart is they don't understand that God is not trying to force you to do it. If somebody's tried to force you to do it, that's on them, but that's not God. God just invites you to do it. Do it. it you, your life will work better. You'll be blessed. You'll like it. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. He gave. He's a giver. He's a generous person. It's the best way to live. And so he says, I invite you to do it. And Paul says, I don't want you to do this. I'm asking you, but don't take this as a command. Don't get legalistic with this. Don't, don't feel like you have to do this or God won't accept you or love you or whatever. Just do it because you see that God has been so generous with you that it's fun to be like him and also give. For God loves a cheerful giver. Next, look what he goes on to say. God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need. How many alls are in there? <laughs> Three. What is he leaving out? Nothing. Nothing. In all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You will abound. Where's Eric? There. Okay. No, not Cruz, Tenali. Oh, here. Right here. There. Eric, come on up here. I asked Eric, I was telling the finance team, I said, I'm going to be preaching about money. I'm going to make an appeal. I'm going to make an appeal for people to start giving. If you're not giving, I want to make an appeal. You start giving. If you're already giving, I want you to talk to God. How could I give a little more in a different way? Or if I'm paying tithe, are you giving offering? Then try to do some offering, something like that. And I just asked the finance team, I said, if any of you have a story of God blessing you, of God just honoring your financial giving, and Eric said, oh, I have a good story. I said, would you tell it for everyone? So... Eric, thank you for sharing your story. Happy Sabbath. Um, 
I just wanted to tell, when, when Pastor Rick did bring that up, I mean, I knew exactly uh, what I wanted to say. A number of years ago when Darius Krauss actually was uh, still preaching here, he had a special appeal for a special offering. I think it was kind of toward the end of the year. Um, and he asked if anybody could just take their wallet out and write a check or put some extra cash in the, in the plate. And honestly, I, I looked in and actually I, I had a check, which as a guy, you don't have blank checks in your wallet. We just don't carry them. But I actually had that day a blank check. So I wrote out a check for a certain amount, left Sabbath service, went home, checked the mailbox, and I'm not going to tell you, there was a check from the state of Maryland coded to uh, Form 502, which is basically an income tax refund, for an amount within $20 of what I'd written out for church like two hours earlier. And that was not an income tax refund because it was late in the year and I'd already actually paid the state of Maryland, I believe. And it was unbelievable. I just, I mean, it was a blessing. It absolutely was that fast. It, I, I just couldn't believe it. Awesome. And I know earlier this morning for first service, you, you, may, you mentioned our heavenly father and doing this. I want to give you a story about my actual father, my earthly dad. Last weekend I was in Florida and just as an example of one of the ways I think that God works out, that it might not just come from the weather. Um, I was leaving my dad after spending the weekend with him, and he'd take me to the airport. He said, hey, did you park your car at the airport, or did you get dropped off? I said, no, I parked the car. I left kind of early. And he said, oh, so how much did you have to pay for parking? I said, I don't even know, like $10 a day. So he, as he's dropping me off at the airport, as a 50-year-old guy, man, he's like, here, this is for your parking at the airport. <laughs> like... I took that money, <laughs> okay? And I was a little, like, embarrassed, but of course I'm the only one there, so it wasn't like my brother or sister trying to make jokes about me taking money from my dad. But now I think I know this was a blessing again as a different way of just doing something, and you get reimbursed for different things. You are blessed. Yeah. So I just want to say that's what touched me in my life, writing a check out, being reimbursed immediately the same day and so I just wanted to share that. Thank Thanks. Thank you, Eric. And Eric, if our earthly fathers want to bless us, <laughs> exactly. yeah, if our earthly fathers want to bless us, how much more our Father in Heaven wants to pay, even if we're 50 years old or 60 or plus. God, as a giving Father, wants to help. And all of us who are parents know that feeling. Even if our kid asks us money and we know it's bad or it may not be the best to give them money, we still want to give it, and sometimes we still give it, even knowing it's probably not the best for them, but they asked and they need it, and okay, because we love our children, and God loves you, and he will give you abundantly what you need and all that you ask for. And I want to close with this story. Well, next slide. First, I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you, and I'm going to be very specific. I have a challenge for you this morning. In the Bible, it clearly asks for one-tenth, 10% of whatever income that you have. And it asks you to give that back to God. And here in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we return that as a tithe. that goes on your tithe envelope, or you can see now we're uh, very sophisticated. You can give online. And the cool thing is with the online giving, uh, if you go to our church website, just click on it, and you can set it up as a reoccurring payment. So you make sure that that's the first money. Because, by the way, if you don't make God's money first, you know what happens. If you wait to the end of the month to see if you have your tithe left, the devil will make sure you don't have it. It's the same as our children's story. You have to put the bigger things in first. You have to have God as the first priority, and then the others will come. And then also we believe and teach that God, as, as he did in the Bible, asks for offerings. And offerings are just special donations that you would give above and beyond. And so this church, our local church, all the ministries that we have here are paid for by your giving to the local church budget. If you submit tithe to this church, we send that to do the work all over the world. It does not stay here other than to pay my salary. I'm part of the global network that we have, but it really doesn't stay here. So we need you to give the local church budget. And if you saw our offering slide today, we're like $11,000 behind. But I'm not here to guilt you into doing that. I'm just giving that as an option. If you're not giving to church budget, maybe that's something God asks you to do because you believe in what we're doing here locally. And we've got some big visions coming up you'll be hearing more about, and I'm excited about that. So I, I think it's a good cause. But you know what? It's not about whether it's a good cause primarily. 
It's about you and God and your heart. Because, yeah, any cause you give to, and I hear this argument all the time, oh, I'm not going to give to the church because they waste the money or they do this or that. Go to any nonprofit, any organization. It's run by sinful humans. There's probably some waste of money in any nonprofit thing you're going to give to. So don't expect it to be perfect. But what you do need to do is find out, God, how can I give? What can I give to? In what ways? And so I'm just asking you to consider paying tithe here at our church. You can do it online, giving a local offering. You can give to certain causes if you want to do that. Next slide. Maybe it's disasters and maybe it's other ways that you can give. Maybe there's a homeless shelter or something that you really feel uh, makes a difference. Those are ways that you can give offerings, and that's what I encourage you to think about, an offering that you can give to help support, especially at times when there's people in need. Maybe it's a neighbor of yours that just has that moment. I read a story this week about a lady who, she, she found out that her neighbor um, could not afford even to get a haircut. And so she really wanted to get one, and, and I know for ladies, a haircut is a little more expensive than it is for us men with the buzzers and the clippers and all that. And so she decided that she would pay for her neighbor to get a haircut. It was like a hundred and some dollars to get a nice haircut in color or something, whatever it was. And she said, right after she committed to paying for this woman's haircut, she had a plumbing issue in her house. And now the plumber had to come out and she's like, oh no, you know, maybe I shouldn't pay for the lady's haircut, but I already said I would. And she just went on faith. And she said they went and the plumber came out and fixed everything. And then she went and paid for the haircut. And a month later, when the bill came from the plumber, it was marked paid in full. And she has no idea who paid her plumbing bill, how it got paid, and why she just got a receipt that was paid in full. But the plumbing bill was way more than the haircut she paid for her neighbor. But she said, God, I get it. I get what you're doing in my life. So I want to fast forward my own life. I, would, I took you 16, 22, two years ago, 2016, three years ago, 2016. I'm going through a separation with my marriage. I'm at a really low point, as you can imagine, anybody who's been through this, it's a terrible thing to have to go through. And so I had moved out, and the only thing I could afford on my pastor's salary, because I'm still paying for the house for my uh, soon-to-be ex and the kids and all that, is a little room that I rented. And I found a townhome that wasn't far from where I lived, and that was a blessing. And, he, and the young man, who was a little Egyptian guy, he was in his 20s. He was renting out all the rooms in this house. Uh, he, he wanted to be rich. By the way, this little guy listened to Dave Ramsey all the time. It was really cool. <laughs> and he was a, a Christian from Egypt, but he had just immigrated to the U.S. And this was his way of income, and so he rented every single room in his house. And so I was there with a guy from Iraq and a guy from Cambodia. None of the people in the house spoke English very well. And I move in, and I rent this little room, and it's on the first floor, and everybody else has a room up on the third floor. And of course, it's really hard for me because I'm in someone else's house. I'm in a tiny room out of a house, and the adjustment is, is devastating. And of course, I'm missing my girls and a whole, whole mess. It was about a month after I moved in. I remember it very well. It was a Friday night, and I'm sitting at the little cheap kitchen table that he had bought. <laughs> he had barely put any furniture in his house. And so this little tiny kitchen table that probably got for free at Goodwill or something, and the grief, the grief of what I'm going through and the loneliness of being in someone else's house just renting a room is just overwhelming to me that night. And the tears are starting to come and the heaviness is there. And even though intellectually I can say, I know God has a plan, I know it'll be better one day and I know whatever, at that moment there seemed like no hope. And everything was dark and I felt so incredibly alone and I was missing my kids, and I was missing my ex, and I was missing my family, and I was missing having a home, and I was wondering why in the world, how in the world, God, did I end up here? How could this be? Why is this happening to me? And with the deep grief, there also rose a little anger. I think that's natural with grief. And I thought, you know, this, somebody has done me wrong. This, this must be my ex. This must be my parents. No, maybe it's Adventism. Where, wait, maybe it's even God. Why has God allowed this? to happen to me. And as I sat there, I can still feel the table. My arms were so heavy. I was leaning on it. I don't know what I was eating, but it didn't taste good. And I was just miserable. And all of a sudden, a little spark in the back of my brain said, it can't end like this. 
Because there was another part of my brain that said, you know, it'd be nice just to fall into eternal sleep. It'd be nice just to drift off and never wake up. Because I don't know, I don't like it. I don't like where I'm at, it hurts too much. But a little spark in the back said, no, it can't end like this. It can't end like this. And then it said, you know the one I should be mad at? It's the devil. He loves this. He loves to hurt. And I, I had just enough spiritual awareness to say that's really who I should get mad at. And then, then I said, well, what can I do? What can I do? And it came into my mind that a couple months before I had attended a young adult retreat and this was a beautiful weekend, and I'd help plan it and be part of it. And we had asked a young adult to come up and speak. And she told this amazing story of how she had gone to Uganda on a mission trip. And while she was there, she saw all these children going through garbage and at the dumps, trying to find something to eat. And it broke her heart. And she thought of, of course, our life in America and all the food we throw away and all this stuff. And she said, I can't do nothing. And so just as in, in her 20s, she just decided to start an orphanage. Didn't know how to do it, but she figured out how to do it. She started an orphanage and a program that would allow kids to have meals and, and get them in school and all these kind of things. As a 20-year-old, just not knowing what to do, but just being moved by God. And I was so impressed with her story, and as I'm there in, in, in my deep sadness and, and mourning that night, that comes flashing into my mind. And I said, oh, I was really moved by what she's doing. And she was asking for people to sponsor kids at her orphanage. And I opened my laptop, and I found her website, and I found where you could click on the link to sponsor a kid. And I signed up that night to sponsor one child, $40 a month, which seemed like a lot because I didn't know if I was going to have any money going through a divorce. And I signed up for 40 a month, and I said, you know what? Devil, you're not going to win tonight. That's all the strength I had that night. That's all I could do was punch a few keys on a keyboard. Don't ask me to go out of the house that night. <laughs> Don't ask me to preach a great sermon that night. But I could punch a few keys, enter my credit card, and put it on reoccurring payment and said, at least if nothing else good happens with my life, I will have sponsored one kid who needed help. Because at that moment, I just needed something. My life had to count for something. I had to know that when I got to the pearly gates, maybe I did one thing right. And I look back on that moment. It's one of the proudest moments of my life. Now, I'm sure I've done other things that have been maybe more significant or powerful or dramatic. But to muster up just that little bit of strength that night in my deepest need, in my deepest hour of pain and hurt, and to say, I can help somebody else. I am proud of that moment. I still sponsor that kid. It's been deducting every month $40. In fact, well, if you know the rest of the story, God, all the rest of the areas of my life came through. And not because I, I, don't, I didn't even connect it to sponsoring that kid. But maybe it was. But God blessed me. The money came through. My life changed. I got a car. I'd lost my car. I got a car. I got a house. I got a wife, <laughs> I got all of it. All of it came back to me eventually. And now I have twice what I ever had before because God blesses, because it is better to give than to receive. And if you give, it will be given back to you. And guess what? I later volunteered to be on the board for that organization. Now I help. In fact, you can look in your bulletin. We have an ad in there for Crystalis. That's the name of the organization. They're doing a fun run on September 30. So sign up. Now I'm going to encourage you. Come make a difference. Or just go to their website and sponsor a kid because they're doing great work. And I had to do something in my sorrow and my pain that would help someone else because I needed to do that. And I would tell you there was no greater therapy for me at that moment than doing that one act. When God asks us to give, it's not because he's trying to take. It's not because he needs the money. It's because he's trying to help your soul. Because he's trying to heal you. We have a disease called sin which says, I got to get more. I need yours. I need to take from you. You need to give to me. And that disease kills us. God wants to bring us life. So I'm going to challenge you. I have uh, our deacons ready. Would you come forward? We're going to do a reverse offering right now. What is a reverse offering, you ask? Well, you're going to find out. In this reverse offering, our deacons are coming forward all the way to the front, please, with the offering plates full of little frogs, because I know you want a cute little green frog. 
And they squeak. <laughs> but before you take your frog, thank you guys right here. Before you take your frog, you and God need to have a co quiet conversation. You need to ask God, what is one more way I could give? That's between you and God. If you're not paying a tithe, I challenge you, and here's the challenge. I'm giving you a 90-day challenge, three months. For the next three months, whatever your commitment is right now, you're going to try it for three months and see what God does. After that three months, you're, you're on your own. If you feel like God did not bless you and it wasn't worth it and it ruined your life, that's on you. That's fine. You don't have to do any more after that. But what I'm asking you for is to take Malachi 3 seriously and test God and say, if I'm not paying a faithful tithe, I'm going to start paying tithe. I'm going to pay it the first part of the bill and just see what happens. I'm going to do that for three months. Take a frog. This frog is going to remind you of that commitment. If you're already paying tithe, maybe you're not doing any offering. So now you can say, well, maybe I can give 1% or 2%, 3% to offering. I'm going to try that for three months and see where God is. In three months, it'll be Thanksgiving. And we're going to have a Thanksgiving service. And I'm not going to preach a sermon. I'm going to ask you to give a testimony. Because I believe God is going to bless you. I believe those of you that are making the commitment today and taking your little frog home, that when you fully rely on God with your finances and give those finances to Him, you're going to say, Pastor, I have a two-minute testimony. I want to tell you how God blessed when I made that commitment. And that's what we're going to do our Thanksgiving service. We're going to give thanks to God for how He blessed us. And whatever your commitment, if you already give tithe and offering, then, you need to, then God is moving you to do something else. Or maybe it's even just to donate some time to volunteer or to help or something like that. Whatever it is, as you take the frog, that is your commitment. So we're going to pass these out right now, and kids can take them too, and kids can make their commitment too if they want. But this is between you and God. Take this frog home, put him on your dresser, put him on your nightstand, put him on your uh, bathroom, take him into the tub. They're, they're probably fine in the tub. <laughs> Wherever to remind you. Put him on your keys. <laughs> put him in your car. Glue him to your dash. Whatever you want to do with these little guys. But when you see this frog, think about what this frog life is.